Hey, and welcome back to Game Talk. I'm your host, Ahmed Mian. Today, I'm joined by Connor. Hey, guys. And Mike. Hello. And this week can be thought of as sort of part two to our coverage of the whole Xbox situation rumor mill last week. We delayed the episode a bit to catch uh, Phil Spencer and Xbox's official announcement on the matter. And now that it has come to pass, what do you all think? I think it's a big fat nothing burger. It's just, they talked for 20 minutes about nothing. It was a lot of, uh, I guess, business fluff. You know, they use the word growth a lot. They use the word engagement a lot, which really annoys me. But I think if we read into the subtext of what they were saying, there are a few nuggets of information we can kind of discuss. But for the uninitiated, right, we should just start off. The crux of the announcement was that four games are coming to other platforms. Other platforms being PlayStation, probably Nintendo. And the weird thing to me was that they did not name the games. They're keeping that under wraps for some reason. Which is strange because we pretty much know which four it is. At least right, they said in the leaks. They said they're going to be four smaller games, which makes sense, right? No, like, they, f- they said two smaller games and two live service games. Oh, is that what they said? Okay. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, that tracks perfectly with what everyone already sort of knows what it is, right? So we're thinking it's Sea of Thieves, Grounded, Pentiment, and Hi-Fi Rush. Right, which none of those games are... I would say of those games, Sea of Thieves is the most exciting, like like the biggest deal for it to get ported. But yeah. they're all, none of them are made like, they're, it's not 343, you know, it's Bethesda did, a, you know, it was a smaller studio within Bethesda, did Hi-Fi Rush. Rare was, is a pretty old acquisition, but still a Microsoft acquisition. Rare doing Sea of Thieves. I don't know who did Grounded, right. actually. Is that Bethesda as well? Obs- I think it's Obsidian. Obsidian, Obsidian. did Grounded. And then Grounded Pen- was really good, though. Pentiment. Yeah, I, I think these games are all good games, right? But in terms of, let's think about why they're doing this, right? The reason why they are considering multi-platform moves is because they need to increase their revenue because while Game Pass is successful, it's not making the kind of money they need to make right now. Oh, this was another and number this, that they dropped that I thought was really interesting. 34 million members on Game Pass. Yeah. That's higher than I, I mean, expected. I was expecting around 25, right? So... That's about Game how Pass many is Xbox doing well. there are. Yes. I mean, and that tracks, right? Like, why... I mean, I, would say, I was about to say, why would you get an Xbox without Game Pass? But I'm one of those people. But right. I'm a rarity, right? Like, for, for, the, for the majority of cases, if you have an Xbox, you're going to have Game Pass. But what I was getting at, right? Like, these games, maybe Sea of Thieves, could move the needle a bit. Yes. Right, because that's a live service game. It'll be popular. It'll probably gain a few million players on PlayStation and probably even be more successful on Switch, I would imagine, now that I think about it. Yeah, I Sea of Thieves, I think... I, sea of Thieves will not come to Switch. I promise you that. Maybe Switch 2. It would have to be a severely compromised version, right? Hey, which yeah, they Switch won't do. Switch 2 might be able to handle it. it's a multiplayer. Yeah. They... Sea of Thieves barely, barely runs on an Xbox One right now. Yeah. Like, no, it's a, it's a very beautiful game it's a very resource intensive game the newer areas don't run that well anywhere like you know my pc i noticed the frame rate drop it's not below 60 but it's noticeable series x yeah. chugs in the newer areas that they've added it's not going to run on switch but it'll, it'll come to playstation and i think it'll do well there because of the four games that they announced this is the fun one like the most fun yeah i mean have. like uh if these are the four games right they're all good like they're all critically acclaimed, but in terms of like wide player appeal, it's the it's Sea of Thieves. Yeah, I think I, I think Hi Fi Rush is gonna have the PlayStation problem, like where they bring their they bring their games to PC way later and the hype has died down. Hi Fi Rush was definitely a game that had a yeah. ton of hype when it dropped. I don't think it gets that back on a port, isn't? It? I think it's already on Switch, isn't it? Or is that? Yeah, it might be. I no, I don't believe it is. Okay. I can see it doing pretty well on Switch then. I don't see it doing super well on PlayStation. But yeah, I guess the point I was getting at, right, like, Sea of Thieves, to me, is their big game in yeah. this go-around, assuming they're going to port more games, and we'll talk about that later. No, it, it's but, a good live service, like, world, I, I don't know. I 
That's an easy recommendation from me in the state it's in now. But if their intent, which this is their intent, right, is to make more money, right? Like that's why you do this kind of move right. to put put your games everywhere, get more money out of it. If their intent is to do that, they have to know these smaller games like Hi-Fi Rush and Pentiment aren't going to move the needle very much. So Pentiment I guess my particular- question to you guys is why why these games? Like I understand Sea of Thieves, but Pentiment and Hi- Hi-Fi Rush, Grounded also is a multiplayer game, right? So I could see that. But well, Part of it, I think Hi-Fi Rush is is Unity, so probably not a terribly difficult port. It's either Unity or... I think these are all Unity or Unreal games, so... It's po- Unreal. Okay. The ports no, probably aren't... Unreal. The ports probably aren't terribly difficult on these. Any way you slice it, though, Pentiment is a hard sell. I... If I'm being, I, I like that Pentiment exists before I say what I'm about Same. to say. I am glad it exists for what it's worth. I can't believe it is a is an Xbox first party game. <laughs> like, yeah, it's it's definitely. It is so uh, weird a black and so for boring. Them. I I did give Pentiment a shot and I respected it. I was like, okay, it, this is a unique vision and that's cool, but like, I cannot get it's, into it. It's like a yeah. I also gave it a. I gave it probably like four or five hours. I think I gave it a. Because I, oh, I yeah, had that's rec- more than I gave it. I, I had recently bought my TV, uh, my OLED, and it was actually a game that looked particularly good, like uh, on yeah. there. So I was playing it, but it. Uh, no, I I don't. I have a very hard time believing Pentiment is going to make up for even the porting costs selling on PlayStation. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like part of me believes that these kind of games were selected as a sort of kind of low-key way to get people used to the idea of bringing games to other platforms because they're they're threading a very difficult needle right now. Like, if they came out and announced Starfield and Indiana Jones, there would likely be, like, a mass exodus off of Xbox, and they don't want that because their primary Game Pass revenue comes from Xbox. So, like, I think they're getting the audiences in general more used to the idea with some of these smaller games. That was my take on it. I could I, be totally wrong. Yeah, I don't know. I don't I think that's just such heavy speculation that I don't have an opinion on it. Uh, yeah, I mean like we we don't have proof at all. Yeah. Like, I'm I'm just sort of reading The thing Phil Spen- reading implications. Phil Spencer said that he believes that in like 5 to 10 years time the idea of an exclusive only coming to one platform, he thinks it's going to go away in general. I think when he says that, he's referring to the PC cloud Xbox space as well as the PlayStation PC space. I, d- I did not interpret that as him saying, like, hey, you know, the next Halo is going to come to PlayStation. I That's not how I read that. But yeah, I, I could and, see and someone like it that way. Uh, I mean, the way I read it was like, I could even see in 10 years, right? 10 years is a long time. I could see in 10 years some PlayStation games coming to Xbox because, like, if you've already got a well-defined ecosystem, porting some games to your rival platform is just a way to make more money. I could, if you can yeah. guarantee people on your platform aren't going to go over to the other one. I could see but, Helldivers coming to Xbox, for instance. Yeah, yeah, me too. But I could not see... In this hypothetical future, Phil Spencer is thinking of Nintendo putting their games everywhere. No. I don't think that's... No, they're We're, just we're too... not even in the realm of possibility of that happening. Yeah, they're too head in the sand for that. I Or, not head in the sand. They're too stubborn. I, I just can't imagine it. Yeah, and plus, I think just their business model works. Nintendo's business model works way better than PlayStation's and Xbox's. Because PlayStation is having their own problems right now. Their AAA games are costing too much. They're going to have to lay people off to to make ends meet. Similarly with Xbox, they just spent a fortune on Activision Blizzard. And I, I still believe, I firmly believe, upper Microsoft management is looking at them and we're like, we need more money to come out of you. Game Pass isn't generating the kind of money we need to come out of you. And that's why they're considering this third-party multi-platform strategy. So while Sony and Microsoft, I guess just to the nature of their like marquee AAA kind of high budget model for game development, they're having to resort to like these different strategies where Nintendo just sort of works. 
because their 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 costs aren't ballooning relative to the other ones, and they still make high quality games that like a lot of people are interested in. No, I think it's interesting to look at everything now through the lens of the Nintendo Wii, like that generation, because Nintendo then and there saw the writing on the wall. They, they right then they saw the ballooning costs of AAA the, games. The arms race, right? Yeah. They saw the arms, and race they and talked about like, it. We don't they want to par- they yeah. saw the blue ocean. They said we can make much cheaper games that have much wider appeal. And while I think the Wii generation, I mean, obviously it performed really well, but I think it was a little rough on that. But and then the Wii U was much worse. But then they adapted, and now like the Switch. They they have excellent AAA Nintendo games with very broad appeal, and they're moving a lot of units. Yeah, yeah, and and like I, I kind of understand fr- to an extent that like their bed is made now. Like and, I have no idea how PlayStation or Microsoft could ever renege on the promise of having these and, uh, huge budget going, AAA games without losing their audience. I want to add something about Activision Blizzard because recently I saw that the uh, FCC's or FTC. One of those two bureaus is investigating them because of the Activision Blizzard layoffs. Because as part of the terms, yeah. uh, they agreed that they would not restructure the company and it would act independently. And those layoffs may or may not be a violation of that independence. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, so. They might have to divest that big purchase, <laughs> which would be hilarious because we just spent like five years spinning our wheels. If that's the case, yeah, yeah that that was a pretty big deal, right? Like. Microsoft said they wouldn't uh, fire everyone, and then they fired everyone, and they that's fired a problem, right? Like, and then, and then um, the FCC might get involved. Is it the FTC or the FCC in this case? It might be the FTC. I think it's Federal Trade Commission. Yeah, it's so. FTC. But yeah, I think in to that point, Mike, I think it's largely just Microsoft calling their bluff, right? Like they're like, we're going to fire these people. And you're going to come after us, but nothing is going to come out of it. I think they made that calculation, which, I mean, it sucks to see, but I think as a large business, that's what Microsoft is thinking. They're, they're banking on the FTC not not attacking and the FTC Not following might. through. Yeah. And, and to that point, Mike, I think uh, another thing they mentioned was the Activision Blizzard deal in this little talk. And I think uh, the... What do they say? I think the first uh, Activision Blizzard game is coming to Game Pass soon. Like yeah, Diablo 4 Diablo at the end of 4. March. They're killing me even more on Diablo 4. Worst $70 I right. ever spent in my entire life. Perhaps the worst deal in all of history. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, I think this, again, like it, it's it's really a tale of like the implication with this, with this particular... Uh, show that they put on because i i'm reading into the tea leaves again and i don't know if i'm right but i do think it's interesting that they did not mention call of duty coming to game pass yeah and obviously call of duty was the big reason this whole thing happened in the first place but you know if they put call of duty on game pass they will lose a lot of money compared to how much it would sell without game pass i think at least i think like but they there, said, e- e- even if it goes on Game Pass, there will be an audience on Xbox that buys it. But I, I do think they would make a lot more money for Call of Duty specifically if it was not on Game Pass. I agree, but they did say Activision Blizzard games are coming. To, I, I interpreted that as like new releases are going to be day one Game Pass. Yeah, no, th- that she Sarah Bond, right? Yeah. Sarah Bond, who who's uh, one of the Xbox like high ups at this point. She she did say that. And that surprised me when she said that. I was like, so do you mean even Call of Duty is coming to Game Pass Day 1? That would be... I I think she I did. would be very surprised to see that, yeah. Just because I think, uh, like, money-wise, that would be kind of crazy. Because people are willing... <laughs> tens of millions of people are willing to pay for Call of Duty already. Yeah. I So they talked a lot about Fortnite in this <laughs> in this meeting, actually. They talked about games that are bigger than platforms. Right. And I... And they mentioned Pal World as well. The whole time they were talking about that, what I was hearing is that they want to bring Call of Duty. They want that to be their Fortnite. They want a game that is bigger than their platform. 
Yeah, I that's mean, I think I that, there. and it is. I would say yeah, yeah. it already and, is and, there, and, but and that's why I mean, like, Call of Duty is the big reason this deal happened in the first place. So, yeah, Call of Duty will be everywhere forever because it is on that sort of Minecraft level, right? Yeah, Minecraft is another ubiquity. one. That, yeah, it's bigger than any platform, and that makes sense. Like that business model makes sense. That's obviously how you make the most money. It's just like way easier said than done, right? Creating a Minecraft or Call of Duty level hit with like the gaming populace. Yeah. It's not yeah. I don't know. They there were a couple other business level things that they said that I take umbrage with in this uh well, I don't even know the in the podcast that it was. I mean, as a side note, it is weird to me that this was a podcast. It, like it could have easily been a couple tweets it could have been a press release a press something. release would have made the most sense yeah because it was well what's weird is they talked about it like like they were planning a direct for it at one point and then because of the leaks that's been pushed back now because they 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 said they had an original plan and that it changed. they had an original plan of like late march or something announcing this in a more i guess formal way but like as we saw like the internet caught on fire when rumors started spreading about this so they decided to get ahead of it and just say it. But, like, it, something just doesn't add up to me. Like, why did it take a week? I don't know. Like, maybe there's a perfectly logical explanation for it, but I just found that a little strange. It's all very strange. The thing that really bothered me, they talked about their layoffs. They said, unfortunately, we had to do, you know, it was a bunch of corporate talk. But right. they they said in the same sentence that, like, in order for our business to be sustainable, we have to be growing. And those are opposing ideas you cannot be sustainable if you require growth there is a finite number of people that are ever gonna buy an xbox like Mm -hmm. it's sustainable is we made a game it sold enough copies to pay for itself that's sustainable that's not what they're doing i mean what they're doing right like they spent all that money on activision blizzard they have that many more mouths to speak yeah, feed, no, they so have no, speak, right? They have no and interest now, in sustainable. To, to start being profitable again, like they have to <laughs> let go of people. Yeah, which the, like, sucks. Like it, it. Yeah, they just have no interest in sustainable. That's I. I don't know why they used that word because every single action they've taken and every word that they said, other than that, is the opposite of sustainability. You can't like you want to look at a sustainable company. You look at Valve, like. They they don't their games make enough money to pay for themselves and that like they're good. They're not they don't have to grow. Like if Steam never got another user, Valve would continue to operate exactly how it does now until the end of time. I, I agree with you, but like we're talking about Microsoft here, right? Three trillion dollar company, richest company in the world. Like no, I agree. they're gonna be thinking about growth all the time. They're not yeah, and and it's not sustainable. <laughs> they you know it's not you, you can yeah. look at a company like Netflix. Netflix did a lot of things because they thought they could grow forever and they hit a wall. And that's why we're getting yeah. all this password sharing crackdown that we're getting now and all these shows getting canceled. It's because the well dried up. They were not, they hit a wall. A lot of, uh, they, uh, yeah, a lot of tech companies founded in the last uh, couple decades have all been built along the idea of you can grow infinitely. And we're, we're hitting that wall now. We're hitting the infinite growth wall. Yeah, it's an obnoxious idea. It was yeah. never, it was obviously never true to you anyone had, paying attention. Yeah, you had people with a lot of money and no sense just continuously throwing money with the promise that like, oh, it'll make money one day. It'll make money one day. And it just never will. Just extremely unwise you know, like, business decisions. We always talked about, and this isn't just an idea exclusive to us, but like the idea of the implosion of the AAA gaming space, or at least a radical change because the current pace isn't sustainable, do we think we're already in it with all I the layoffs in 2023 and It looks pretty bad, yeah. We have already crossed the amount of layoffs of last year, and we're only and it's in February. February. Yeah, it yeah. is February 15th. We are halfway through this month. No, I mean, in my yeah. opinion, the future, a sustainable future of with quality games looks like worker owned studios that you know f- probably fewer than 100 employees making good you know making strong games and then 
paying their employees a fair share of that and then making more games. And I think maybe the end result of what's happening at Xbox, more to an extent at Xbox and and to Sony to a lesser extent, but still happening there, that is is just that, right? Like they downsize all these companies to where they're like a, you know, a, a small reliable quantity of heads that they can count on and then just rely on them to push out quality releases because... They, uh, I mean, like, especially during COVID, like, everyone overhired, and, uh, the good times came to an end, and now all of a sudden people have to be let go. But, like, COVID only accelerated a problem that already existed in the gaming industry, where AAA game costs were ballooning more and more and more and more, because more and more devs were needed, and more and more devs were needed for longer amounts of time. And, uh, at the end of the day, right? Like, it's not sustainable something's got to give and i think we're in the in the giving phase now yeah that's what it feels like for sure and what's giving is the people right like they're letting go of people to try and get back to that i guess positive trajectory but like i mean the people are the one that brought you here in the first place so well they're giving exclusivity too i that's 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 another thing that's falling exclusivity is falling specifically to combat this triple a growth problem and and i think they're right that is that's the that's the last big windfall that they can get you know a port is not but then what happens after that it's yeah that's it that's that (laughs) you know you can't there's only so many platforms out there you know you bring it to pc you bring it to playstation and then once you know once you've saturated those markets well you know what who in those markets are going to buy your games at least more layoffs i guess yeah it's a, I, I just think that like, like you said, these companies are going to target growth all the time because that's what they do. But I do think they're just being a little too overambitious, right? If their expectations were a little more in check, like I think we would be fine in the AAA space. But the reality of the situation is I think Xbox missed Game Pass's growth targets by something like 60 or 70%. That's what I read. Wow. Sony missed PlayStation 5 sales target by several million last quarter. Yeah. Like, it's just too aggressive. And then when those growth targets aren't met, shareholders are not happy. And then people have to be let go to save costs. And it's just a terrible, vicious cycle that can all be remedied by just having more measured growth expectations. Or sustainable business practices that or <laughs> that that don't rely on growth. <laughs> yeah. Although you can't, I mean, it, it's illegal to not to have a company that's not growing in the United States. It's essentially yeah. illegal uh, because you have to uh, sh- you have to make the most possible money for shareholders in a public. Yeah, they're like a f- fiduciary obligation or something. Is that the right term? Yeah, I think sure. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, we're not business people. Yeah, but yeah, I think uh, I mean that was a bit of a tangent, but I think it's all related to the kind of things Xbox talked about today. One other thing they mentioned, and I thought this was interesting because it was like a bit of a tease, but they did tease a next gen console. You guys catch that? Yes. Yeah. The biggest, so they said the biggest yeah, I mean, hardware like, <laughs> jump in history. Yeah. The same thing they said about the series X, but what well, I mean, isn't it true, right? Like just by the nature of the power of like, it'll be the uh, biggest and most compute? meaningless yeah the biggest and <laughs> like least noticed power every jump in history. generation jump is the biggest jump in history right am i crazy yeah i mean oh, okay so there's also an easy slam dunk for this is if they measure it against the series s <laughs> that's true yeah <laughs> they have an out yeah but yeah i mean like it sounds exciting and like i i have to give phil and co credit they're very they're very clever business people in the sense that they can say anything and spin it to be positive yeah like that's that's an impressive skill to have but i think and again could totally just be me being a conspiracy nut but i think over the years with xbox in particular you have to pay attention to what they're not saying and their actions in addition to what they are saying to really parse what's going on with them yeah yeah that's fair i just it's impossible to say right now. Yeah. We just don't have, we don't have enough. But yeah, so, I mean, like, one thing with this next-gen Xbox idea, I think it was smart for them to say, because it did, like, kind of dissuade the notion of them getting out of the hardware business, which I thought was always a ridiculous idea if we 
go back one episode. It was you fun to play saying, with, but yeah, it was never going to happen. There's no way it's going to happen. It, it, it was a fun hypothetical, but like in the near future, absolutely, it's not going to happen. But but along with Xbox teasing their new console, right? Like we got word that PlayStation was in the second half of their uh, PS5's life cycle, which is wild to think, yeah. but I guess it makes sense from a time perspective. One, it's one just exclusive weird to... game and we're in the second half <laughs> right? of the PS5. Yeah, like Spider-Man it just, 2 it's is... It's just weird to hear it. these companies talk like if next gen's around the corner it's just so strange yeah but it it i mean what was it 2020 that the ps5 came out I, 2020 so it's been f- like four three and years. And a half yeah, years yeah we're halfway through yeah yeah so and, and by this point in the playstation 4's life cycle the ps4 pro was already out i believe so okay yeah i do it's not believe there crazy. is any market for a ps5 pro right now i really don't well, the PS4 Pro, like, it sold only a fraction of what PS4 sold. So, like, the Pro version of the console is always kind of a more niche product. Yeah. So people will buy it. It's not going to be the primary way people get a PS5. But, yeah, I don't know. Like, PlayStation also needs a price cut on PS5 now to uh, move more units. Because they said in their, like, financial meeting for the quarter that last year was probably the peak of ps5 sales and they expect it to go down from here Just oh yeah when com- when comparing against the tra- trajectory like historical console over the year trajectory like last year was it so the only way to sort of mitigate that is to buy a price cut but i think the ps5 still costs way too much to make so they can't really do a price cut yeah it Just definitely kind of isn't i don't know 500 dollars for a ps5 right now is a really hard sell too i would say to the consumer like yeah i mean you can get a digital for 400 but I, I see them all the time used for 300 or less for a disc version all the time. I, I've yeah. almost pulled the trigger like a handful of times and I'm kind of glad I didn't because it sounds like Spider-Man's going to come to PC and that's the only one I really care about. But yeah, and I, I, this isn't related to Xbox, but like another quote put, put out by PlayStation this week was something to the effect of like to maximize profits, we're really looking at putting our games out on other platforms and other platforms for PlayStation means PC. It's crazy to me that they don't have a storefront on PC. It would be, I I don't want them to have one. That is crazy. It would be so annoying. I mean, they use Steam, right? Like, yeah, they just release on Steam, but all of their arguments about like the disadvantages and stuff of people playing their games on PC versus console. If they have a storefront that's mitigated, like almost entirely. Yeah. I, I think in the future, it's inevitable. They're going to have to have a storefront. Like, same as Xbox. Yeah, I hope they continue to release their games on Steam, because I don't want to download another storefront, but I just, if that's their hang-up, you know. But yeah, I think the future you were so eagerly anticipating, you and so many others, Connor, of day one PlayStation on PC, I think we're we're getting there. If not this gen, next. Yeah, and no, I think it's probably coming this gen, quite quite honestly. Yeah, I mean, we got it with Helldivers, too. Within a couple years. Well, Sony had already committed that all of their live service games will be day one, day and day with PC. Oh, I didn't know that. So Marathon. Yeah, that, that's always okay. been a thing. So Marathon, uh, what is it? Fair fair Games or whatever. Okay. Or Concord, all of those games. Is Foam Stars are, them? The foam, the weird foam game? Foam Stars wasn't first party. Okay. It was like a... Square. But yeah, I don't know who it was. I don't know. That's we- It's a weird looking game, It's a dude. weird... I don't know yeah. if you've seen any of it. It's a weird game. <laughs> No, they gave it away for free on PlayStation, but I didn't. It's out? Uh, I just grabbed it. Yeah, it's out. I had no idea. But yeah, I didn't really check it out. I know the but, foam is canonically a bodily fluid. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, I didn't need to hear that. <laughs> yes, it is. I saw I saw an official comic. <laughs> There's foam store comics? Yeah, apparently. Whatever, yeah. I Okay, grain of salt. I saw this on Twitter, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah. But yeah, I think... Short announcement from Xbox, like the podcast itself was like 20, 25 minutes, yeah. and most of it was PR fluff, a couple nuggets of interesting information, but I do think, like, just the whole nature of what's happening there is interesting and worth talking about. Like, I do still firmly think that there's no chance that it's just going to be these four games and that's it, right? Like, they did will explicitly be more games four games. say not Starfield or Indiana Jones, though. They explicitly said not yet. Yes. If you go back and listen to it, it no, was a also, complete in, denial. In the interview, they said, uh, we'll never say never. <laughs> like, Yeah, so they, like they're already, like it's a very carefully constructed 
kind of message, right? Like they're they're saying no, but they're incepting the idea in your head that it might happen. And right, like to people like us, it doesn't really matter, right? Like, sure, put your games everywhere, be more successful, pe- more people get to play more games, great. But like to the Xbox exclusive like fan base, right? Like Xbox only owners, it sort of is a big deal for reasons we discussed last episode. So they really got to be careful with those guys in particular when when messaging stuff like this. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I like I think we covered mostly everything around the announcement. Like I I'm really sort of seeing this episode as more of an addendum to last week's. Yeah, I don't think but, I have anything more to say. Yeah, Mike, how about you? Yeah, I don't have anything much to say. Yeah, so I guess uh I'm looking forward to playing Sea of Thieves. <laughs> yeah, it's PlayStation. Yeah, I'm so. looking forward to playing it with you. And and I think it's really funny that uh, just as an aside, I think Skull and Bones like just came out, and it's immediately just going to get shellacked by Sea of Thieves. It's if, already if Thieves... being shellacked by Sea of Thieves. People hate that game. <laughs> yeah, and did you see like what Ubisoft said about it? They, that they it was a quadruple like a, a game, quadruple yeah. a game. No, dude, it's, it's like literally just a worse fives version. out of tens. Yeah. Worst version of the sailing from Black Flag 11 years ago or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and this game was in development for like a decade, Oh, right? yeah, it like, started I, right after Black Flag, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know why this game was in development for like and I, a generation and a half. I watched some gameplay of it, and like, it kind of reminded me of this weird pirate free-to-play MMO I played in middle school. And that's not a compliment. <laughs> like, it, it just... It just looks yeah. really, it looks like the most boring parts of, Bla- like, the silliest, most boring parts of Black Flag. I don't know. I haven't played it, so obviously this isn't a review, but it doesn't look good. They're marketing it. It isn't a review, but I, I do feel more comfortable dunking on Ubisoft without actually playing a game than any other studio. That's so. fair, yeah. It just feels right. All right. Kind of a shorter episode this week, but what do you want us to do? Yeah, <laughs> yeah like it was, it, we, were, we were expecting bigger. Take Xbox. it up with Phil Spencer. Yeah. Yeah. Yellow Phil. So, okay. So, to get this out of the way, we've all been playing Helldivers, but since it's such a rare occasion for us all to play the same game at, its, at the same time, I think next week we're just going to do a Helldivers deep dive kind of episode. So, have you guys been playing anything besides Helldivers? I have been pl- I I forgot. <laughs> I was like, did my internet go out? No, like- I've been playing Red Dead Redemption 2. I forgot that I'd been playing it because I've been playing Helldivers more. Yeah, so you had some spicy takes that maybe have softened a little bit. I mean, I'm no. eager to hear your thoughts. I stand by the fact that the boring of this game, or the boring, the beginning of this game is unforgivably boring for like two, two and a half hours. It gets a little better after that, but like, this isn't a JRPG, and like, I don't know, like GTA doesn't start boring. Like, what what were they thinking? I, I beg to differ. GTA, GTA 5. You were doing something at the start of GTA. It is a really long time before you do anything at all in Red Dead. Like, Bro, like an hour into GTA 5, they asked me to tow a car, and then I turned the game off and never turned it off. That's back fair, on. but it starts with robbing a bank. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot. It does start with robbing a bank. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty good. No, yeah, there's a hook, right? Like, Red Dead 2 has no hook, no interest in a hook. It has a narrative hook, arguably, but it didn't catch me. I was, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I think the narrative hook for Red Dead 2 is if you played Red Dead 1, you're like, oh my gosh, I know all these people. Oh, really? So you're already somewhat invested in everyone except for Arthur Morgan. I had no idea that these were characters from Red Dead 1. Yeah, Red Dead 2 is a prequel to Red Dead 1. I didn't know that at all. Yeah, so I think from that perspective... That probably there, hooked there, a there lot is of a bit people, of a hook, yeah. but if if Red Dead Two is your first game, I can see why you're like, who are these people? Yeah, Why should no, I, I care just didn't care. I knew the name death. John Marston, but I didn't know yeah anything about him. You know, I, I haven't played because they never brought Red Dead One to PC. I don't think so. I, I never got the chance. Yeah, Rockstar is wilding out and crazy. Like, I I don't even. This isn't even like a complaint. It. I think it's funny that this game for its time was pointed to as like super photorealistic and everything. But it doesn't really hold up in 2024 in a, in a weird way. Its art style doesn't hold up. Some of the stuff does, but some of the like cliff face textures are wonky. Some of the uh, yeah, some of the foliage like it's not it, it's not Pokemon bad, but it's not 
it's nothing to write home about. Like it, it's a pretty game. It's nothing special. I was expecting more. I think, but I think GTA yeah, is an easier I, game to, your to make. Credit to your credit. At first, when you told me that, I was like, "You're crazy." But then I remembered it's been six years yeah, no. since Red Dead Two, and this which was a, is just insane to think about. It's a game targeting 1080p six 1080p sixty or thirty. I'm not sure, and I'm playing it at uh 4k 120 in 2024 and like both frame rate and having motion blur turned off which i don't know i don't know if that was an option on console and then also 4k like you can just see more you can see more of the assets than you could back in the day yeah uh when when red dead 2 came out on console it was locked at 30 frames per second and i believe it was like 1440 or 1800p up uh checkerboard upscale to 4k yeah so it yeah i'm just i'm just looking at a much clearer image than you were then and so you can see more and I, i'm not even complaining that much the game looks good i just think it's funny because it was i ex- I had such high expectations i think yeah and I, I that's fair but my counterpoint to that is like if you pick any game six years oh ago, yeah no like, they don't hold up yeah obviously they're gonna be looking good but like graphics move so quickly yeah I, and, and especially games that target photorealism in this way, they age like yeah. milk. So it's kind of a miracle it looks as good as it does. So I'll, I'll give it that compliment. Uh, I don't know. I like it. The more I play of it, the more I like. I think I'll nibble on it for a while. I don't see myself finishing it pretty much ever. It's just going to be something I play. Not when like Persona 3 Reload is out and stuff. Yeah, it is, uh, I think, to get the full Red Dead 2 experience. And by the way, I, I do stand by it. It's a fantastic, fantastic experience. But to get the full experience, you really have to sort of live in that world, which in 2024, that's kind of hard to do, especially for an older game with yeah. all these games coming out. I'm also just not somebody so, that has the time, I think, to do that so much. Yeah. Cause, but uh, even if you beeline the main story, I think the main story is quite good. I think um, I actually have Arthur Morgan's a very good character. I've been enjoying so. the side quests, so I've actually been doing... At least I think they're side quests. I don't know. They're yellow, so I've been doing them. Yeah. I don't know if that means it's a story mission or not. No, Red Dead 2, Red Dead 2 I remember, did a pretty good job of blending those things together, so you don't really know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the the world in Red Dead 2 was, it really felt alive, and uh, it was quite a joy to explore, so. The good parts do, and are. I will say, like, it has the exact same problem as GTA, where, like, before you get to do anything, you get to spend 10 minutes, like, just walking somewhere. Or, you know, in GTA, it's driving somewhere, and this, it's riding a horse somewhere. Right. No part of that is fun. It it would be so much better if it was just a linear game that had, a min- like, a level select. Everything about it would be better, in my opinion, <laughs> with, a, with a hub world town that feels alive. Like, I... Yeah, I, I suppose am s- the argument I would give, at least, is that riding through the world was enjoyable, for me, at least, just because existing in that world was enjoyable. But if it's not for you, I can see why it would the, be kind of a chore. The moment Breath of the Wild came out, the horse riding in this game was outdated. It feels so bad, like, in comparison. It... Yeah, they just feel and like that cars. That is one thing and <laughs> for Rockstar that I hope they kind of alleviate for Grand Theft Auto Six, but I don't think they will. Their main philosophy in their games seems to be realism over gameplay. Yeah, ease. and it's so it's a negative. There's here all for sorts sure. of things where like it's cool that they paid this much attention to detail for the littlest interactions, but it can get frustrating when like you're expecting way more snappy responses, snappier controls, and you just don't get that. Because they chose to sacrifice it for realism. Yeah, I accidentally ran over a guy with my horse, and I have like a hundred and seventy dollar bounty now that I just I don't want to pay that off. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know stuff like that. And like the realism of riding my horse through the world is broken immediately by me getting impatient and mashing the A button to run it as fast as I possibly can. And that's not what traveling by horse was like pretty much mm. ever. <laughs> so. I don't know. A fast travel mod would go a long way for me. Is there no fast travel in that game? There are trains you can ride. Okay. I, I couldn't remember. I have not gone to a second train station yet. So I still, they still have you like, I'm in the early game. I'm in like the first camp near Valentine. And so like every yeah. single thing I do, I'm having to ride from the camp to Valentine, then probably to a third place, then back to Valentine, then back to camp, then back to Valentine. And it's just so boring. I see. Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah, it's not yeah, a bad I, game overall. Twenty bucks was a fair price for it. If I'd have paid seventy, I'd have been really mad. I'd say. 
Well, this game came out in the era of $60 games. Yeah. I, if I'd paid 60 I would have been a little mad. <laughs> I'm glad I waited. Patient Gaming wins again. Yeah, and uh, I, I guess if, the more you nibble on it, the more I do think you'll I, I do suspect, appreciate like, and enjoy it. Yeah, once I finish the game, I'll have a different opinion probably once I'm invested in the characters and stuff. Because right now yeah. I like, I know Arthur Morgan's name, and I know John Marston's name. I know Dutch, I know Micah. I don't think I could tell you anyone else. And I, I only know Micah because I don't like him. <laughs> and you have quite the unique perspective, too, because you're playing Red Dead 2, which canonically takes place before Red Dead 1. Right. And that's not the w- way most people played Red Dead 2. So your your perspective is kind of interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah, I'll let you know if I, if I keep at it. All right. Uh, Mike, what about you? I haven't really played anything. Nothing, huh? Uh, other than uh, playing Fallout again. Which one? Uh, I installed Tale of Two Wastelands, Fallout New Vegas, and Fallout 3. And what it does is it ports all of Fallout 3 into New Vegas' engine. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. I bet you so, love that. Yeah, I started out playing Fallout 3, and uh, I have the opportunity to also play through New Vegas with the same character at some point. Messes up the narrative a little, doesn't it? But Not really, no. Okay. It kind of seamlessly the- weaves them together. Like, you can do all of Fallout 3's narrative, and then you can take that character and go to New Vegas and start the New Vegas narrative. Okay. I only barely yeah. made it out of the first town of New Vegas. I think I made it to the first yeah. bandit camp. So, With the lock- that's going to be cool a idea, long though. playthrough. Yeah. Yeah, so it basically just smashes Fallout 3 and New Vegas into one thing. Yep, plus all the DLCs. That's cool. Yeah, everything is there. Uh, I'll I'll have more thoughts on it as I play more of it. I've been taking it kind of slow because I've been busy, very busy the last week. Tis the season for business. Yeah. Busy yeah. All right. I think I'll close this out. I haven't really played anything aside from Helldivers and Persona. So just uh, alternating between these two and, you know, my saga of just fighting the terrible Wi-Fi here in Charleston. Oh, my God. Yeah. Has been... Uh, frustrating to say the least but i think wi-fi is in a good stable s- space right now case in point me recording this episode with you guys yeah no issues <laughs> but yeah we'll have more to say about hell divers next week but persona 3 reload i'm over 31 hours in now uh, i just got past the the classic beach episode that <laughs> every persona game seems to have so that was a lot of fun and uh i think the The beach trips in general do a lot to endear the characters to me in each Persona game, and this game was no different. Like, I'm definitely a lot more attached to the cast now than I was at the start of the game. Yeah. Uh, And and that's not to say, I I think these are all solid characters, and they're they're just growing on me even more. So I'm I'm curious to think, uh, like we mentioned last week, right? Like, how do they compare to the casts of Persona 5 and Persona 4? They're getting up there. So I I really like these, these characters... Uh, excited to see what happens later on in the story because, as I mentioned last week, Persona Three has an infamous uh, sort of end game. So I also learned it's not as long as I like. thought it was. It's like sixty sixty eight hours long. It's it's the shortest Persona game. Yeah, which yeah. makes sense. Well, it's the first sh- modern. shortest modern Persona game. Yeah. let's just say. So, so I that I, that's actually like a green flag to me. I'd love to actually like you know <laughs> finish a Persona finish game. a Persona I've never game. Finished one. <laughs> So. I mean, yeah, like, and Persona 5, my god, dude, like, especially with Royal, it's, like, easily, like, 100, 120. Oh, yeah. Which is just craziness. No, I got I got to, like, the last dungeon, I think, or no, the second to last dungeon, I think, in Persona 5, and then, like, Royal became available to me, and I just gave up. <laughs> dude, and, the, and I haven't played Royal either, but, like, the most frustrating thing to me is people say that Royal has the best content in the series. That's what I've heard, yeah. Which is only accessible, like, after... 80 hours or something yeah. and i'm like are you kidding me <laughs> the day will come when i need persona 5 in my life again that's what i'm waiting for dude yeah I, honestly like me too <laughs> I, I i'm gonna get my butt kicked by life at some point and i'm gonna have nothing else <laughs> i'm gonna have persona yeah. 5 royal waiting for me <laughs> no like my, i mean my life in particular lately has been a bit stressful just due to like job related things and yeah. persona 3 huge source of comfort oh like, yeah it's so cozy co- Co- coziest games ever as far as i'm concerned so continuing to play persona 3 gonna play i mean i'm gonna finish this game like there's no i'm just gonna keep playing it until i finish it there's yeah, no my leaving life has it been a little back. a little chaotic recently too for yeah. obvious reasons 
But no, I, I, that being said, I'm glad we can all, even in our chaotic times, come together and record this podcast, which has released every week so far. This the year, year of game talk. The year yeah. of game talk. So I think that's it for now. Shorter episode, but thank you all for listening. You can follow us at Ad Podcast Game Talk on Twitter. Please like, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or any other podcast services you use. Click the link in the description of the episode to join our Discord and talk to us there. Thank you, Connor and Mike. Yeah, see you guys next week. See you next week.